It's Song Talk Radio with Michael, Neil, Phil, and the gang. Welcome to Song Talk Radio. This is episode 314. This is the show with songwriters talking to other songwriters about the craft of songwriting. We share tips, tools, and techniques, and together we all become better at writing songs. And now we are online. Yes, we're all virtual. We're, we're all vir- virtual. virtually here. I'm not. I'm, uh, I'm virtual. <laughs> and uh, I'm your host tonight, Neil Modi, and with me are the self, self-isolated members of the Song Talk Radio Action Team. We have Forlorn Phil. <laughs> Quite, um, yes, that's yeah, hi. <laughs> yeah, yeah just, say, just, just say yes and smile. <laughs> and we got Monkish Mike. How are you? He's, how's, every, how's, that, how's everyone surviving with peace and love and, and goodwill in your hearts, I hope? <laughs> oh, absolutely. And uh, please send your comments and questions to at Song Talk Radio on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram, or feedback at songtalk.ca, and we'll share them on the show. And please visit us at songtalk.ca to find out how you can be a guest. And today, we're very privileged to have a longtime friend of the show, Frank Horvat. Frank is a accomplished multi-genre composer and pianist who made the tricky musical leap that allows him to pursue a niche of his own. Frank gives his audiences time and space to reflect in this fast paced world. His compositions tell deeply personal stories while permitting audiences to ponder their own. Whole Note Magazine called Frank one of the most inventive songwriters to come out of the contemporary scene in Canada. Whether he writes for his band, the concert stage, or film or TV, his music is both intense and introspective. Frank's compositions are often based on global social injustices as well as the wondrousness of life, love, and longing. Welcome back to Song Talk Radio, Frank. Thank you, Neil. Wow. You wrote that or what? You wrote all that text. I, I, I pulled I pulled some of it off your website. <laughs> <laughs> Just take credit for it. It's yeah, yeah. awesome so, coming from you. So, I especially like the word wondrousness. <laughs> well, well, hey, you're a wordsmith. What can you say? You know, exactly. pat yourself on the back. Uh, I didn't know you had a band. You have a band? Ah. Uh, doesn't everybody, Doesn't everybody have a band? Yeah. <laughs> at, one, at, one, at one point, not anymore. Not anymore. But Frank's band is actually called the Frank Horvath Band, so it's okay, it's really okay. our band. <laughs> it's it's very pretentious, really. Honestly, yeah. Yeah. fair enough. Fair enough. So th- this this project you've been you've conceived of just when this whole pandemic situation hit, Frank. Why don't you tell us about where that where that came from? What uh, did it just strike you that you should do a, a music for self isolation? I want you to describe the project as well. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly, Neil. It's just when the I, I don't know about you guys, but I was just completely like blown away by all this happening. Believe it or not. The, the first time it hit me that, oh, my gosh, this this is going to be very serious and this is going to sound awful and almost, you know, uh, obnoxious and stuff. But was the night the NBA stopped playing. I don't know if you guys remember that the NBA season just stopped. And I was just like I became instantly glued to the Internet It's like, what is going on? Like you heard about, you know, the pandemic in Europe and in Asia. And it's like, oh, it it'll never be that serious here and stuff. And then all of a sudden people are getting really sick and things, especially in our music community, everything like within like an, like a day, everything got canceled. It was just like huge piece of news after another, like, you know, orchestras, venues, uh, concert halls, um, um, you know, big tours, you know, just everybody is stopping in their tracks and stuff. So, um, you know, so what can I say other than the fact that when it all went down, I feel that I felt like this huge emptiness of what are we going, what am I going to do? I actually had a album, a new album of solo piano music come out on the last week of March and the whole thing, uh, I was going to do five concerts in Toronto and the whole thing got canceled. And I, I just had this feeling of helplessness. And of course, uh, being on social media, just hearing catastrophic stories of, you know, musician colleagues saying, I don't know what I'm going to do to pay the bills now. Like all my gigs are canceled and, and that type of thing. And so all of those emotions just combined for me to think, um, you know, what can I do? It feels like any project that I was working on at that very moment you know, even though I was just following through with it, it, it felt like it didn't really, you know, uh, 
have anything to do with the world that all of a sudden just overnight it felt like all of a sudden we're living in this new new order of the way we're going to live our life and everything and and so that's how the that's how the project started i basically said it uh, i'm a composer the one thing the way i communicate with the outside world is is through music and and i thought I have to I have to come up with some way where I can continue to compose but stay relevant and stay engaged and stay connected with my fellow musicians and stuff even though we can't physically be in the same room. So, I don't know how I came up with this idea. I think it was a early very early Sunday morning. It just popped in my head about 4 weeks ago and I just thought, "Hey, what if I compose a really short piece of music for every any instrument I can think of plus voice?" and uh, and try to write a piece per day and then share it online and invite people to play it or try it out or cover it or whatever. And so here we are um, at the time we're recording this podcast right now. I've I've got 20 pieces done and um, I've had like, you know, just amazing response from musicians and friends, musician friends from all around the world you know, uh, doing, uh, playing the pieces, covering them, posting on social media, sharing, talking about the whole experience. It's, it's been pretty cool. So. Uh, I have a question, uh, Frank. So you've done 20 pieces. Are they all discrete or can, the, do they fit together to make a, a larger a musical statement or some do, some don't? How does that work? So I've, I haven't been like trying to create like a, a musical motif to say connect them all together or some musical theme that connected. I think the the only thing that connects all these pieces together, because obviously, you know, writing for very different instruments, you know, going from piece to piece and and, and for voice and, and like writing for both classical operatic voice and also like pop singers and stuff and so like i'm trying to think what ties all of this together musically it's probably a the length every every piece or song is anywhere from one and a half to two and a half minutes long most of them are exactly two minutes in length um that's the first thing the second thing is just the mood of the music i feel um i sort of feel like this responsibility that if I'm going to be composing music and sharing it with my colleagues in a time like this, I want it, I want it to be something sort of inspirational or thoughtful, um, something that uh, not only just might sound good, but something that my musical friends would enjoy playing or singing, you know, that might you know, bring them a little bit of joy, a little bit of optimism. So I don't know how successful I am in every single one of those pieces, you know, doing something in, like writing something inspirational sounding, especially with instrumental music, it's a little more of an abstract art, but but um, that's what I'm trying to do. And I guess time will tell when I'm, when this is all said and done in the coming weeks and I've said, okay, that's it. I can't do any more of these. And I stop, then I might sit back and listen to the whole, all of the pieces and think, okay, how did these tie in together? You know, I'm just sort of going with the flow right now. So yeah, I've, I've heard, I've heard a few of them and I've actually, uh, oh. sorry, sorry, go ahead. Uh, one thing is, is that a lot of, um, composers uh when they write music it can be notoriously hard to actually play that music uh because of their own musical levels or just their approach because you're sort of writing for kind of a general populist did you write music that was sort of maybe a little bit more easier to play yeah that's a really great question that's another thing that i've been very conscious of in the process phil so um so i would definitely say a lot of the pieces are are easier to play if you're a professional musician like in a particular instrument you're probably not having to practice very much and that's evident because of the fact that you know i have this routine where i pretty well post the new piece of the day every morning and then i'll do a social media post about it and i've had situations where you know a, like a musician like literally a half a day later or even a few hours later, they're already posting their video performance of the piece, you know, and so that type of thing. But I will tell you something which has been interesting and sort of a musical challenge for me in this type of thing. I'm writing for a lot of instruments 
that I know little or nothing about. And, and I don't know, believe it or not, as a composer, it's actually, it's hard. It, what you end up often doing, if you're not really familiar with an instrument, is you often write music that's impossible to play or, or too hard. So I've really had to study a lot. It's been a great musical exercise in learning about what different instruments are capable of doing and, and that type of thing. I know for various wind instruments, like, um, for example, trombone. I have written very little music for the trombone in my life, a little bit, especially in my student years, but it's been a long time since I've written for the trombone. And so I was really thinking about what the trombone can do, what it can't do well, you know, listening to other people, uh, looking, reading scores and, and that type of thing. And, um, and he, I wrote, I wrote a initial draft of a violin piece and it was, uh, really difficult. And I even write a lot of music for violin and I ended up having to rework it and, and, and do a lot of changes. So it's, it's a bit tricky, but for the most part, what I'm finding is I am trying to keep it simple. So it's an enjoyable process because the last thing you want to do in this thing is frustrate your friends and, you know, give them a brain <laughs> teaser too much and stuff. Some of the pieces are hard, but not too much. So, yeah, because I, I remember a, couple, a few weeks ago, Frank, when you when you introduced the the piano piece and said, oh, I, I think at the time you were saying I was thinking about this and I remember thinking, oh, that's a great idea. And I, I deliberately said, yeah, I'll, I'm happy to do a piano piece as long as it's not too challenging, <laughs> as long as it's not too hard, because I know that you're quite capable and probably eager to write a really challenging piece. And then you then you actually wrote a an easy piano one and then a harder piano one and i saw uh i forget the the lady's name who did the the complex piano piece which was astounding and and really really complicated and i was looking at that thinking even if i wanted to do that i couldn't number one because of my skill level but number two i don't think my 60 note keyboard would have covered the you no. know seven range that you wrote on that thing it was just <laughs> pretty yeah. astounding yeah so, no but, the uh, pianist by the way you're thinking of just a shout out to her because she did a fantastic job with her, her name is lisa tahara so you're right neil i that's actually the the piano i think because i'm a pianist i felt obliged i'm going to write a couple of piano pieces all the other instruments they get a one solo piece but but the piano i felt obliged especially as a piano teacher and being part of the piano teaching community i wrote an easy piece that a that a piano teacher that doesn't get a chance to practice very often or their students can play and then i wrote a piece for a concert pianist and that was that's definitely pretty cool to see lisa pull that off yeah and, and i want to i want to go back to something you're talking about earlier about the, the the feeling of the of the music because especially for the one that, that i played the the easy intermediate piano piece there was a wonderful balance between uh sort of tension notes in the melody and uh and on chord notes Right and and sort of a, a really nice relationship, a bouncing back between tension and 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 release, and and that really, to me, the music itself, the melody itself, conveys that idea of, of uh, sort of melancholy, so optimistic, and also uh, sort of brighter sounding and happier, but not to the point where it's you know super happy pop music, but it's also not super dark. Like it 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 ran this middle ground that. That I think that all of us are feeling right now during this time. There's a lot of uncertainty, but we're trying to stay optimistic and and we want to see you know the light at the end of this tunnel. Yeah, you're bang on, and and this is the I think I think that's the balance I'm trying to go with every day when I sit down to write a piece. And I think I I touched upon it earlier. It's just this you know I want the music to be inspirational and I want it to be thought provoking and introspective, but I don't want it to be you know, you know, cutesy, uh, lively, peppy and that type of thing, because it that sort of almost disrespects the time in which we're living. You know, uh, you know, uh, a lot of people that are playing this music, they've been directly touched by the pandemic in certain ways. And and they're looking they're looking to the music that I'm providing or other music that they're searching for as as a as a means to um, sort of sort of fill something uh, uh, fill a void or a gap in their in their heart you know and 
And so I find that's a very good observation. It's something that I'm just trying to walk a really fine line compositionally. That being said, certain instruments for me just are more conducive to being a little bit more uh, happy. And, and, and it's all, and some are not, and some just yeah. convey that. You haven't done one for ukulele, have you? No, no, that's one I don't know. I'll, I, that's, I have a list of instruments still to go. I'm not sure if I'll get to that one, but, I'm but you sure. know. The whole uh, doom, uh, the whole doom ukulele scene is pretty, uh, pretty hot these days. So. <laughs> the thrash ukulele scene, yeah. Uh, Frank, I'm not going to ask you to pick favorites, obviously, but do you have any? Uh, like, it'd be nice to listen to one. We have, I think, a few queued up. Like that, uh, that you thought did particular, did particularly well, or really surprised you, or or, or just made you happy, or that so, were interesting. Yeah, yeah, there's been uh, there's been everything. I mean, I've been so fortunate to have you know so many friends share videos of the various pieces, and uh, I've had so many surprises, uh, good surprises. Like, wow! I when I wrote it, I never envisioned that interpretation, or say that phrase shaping, or that type of thing. And they're just it just brings it to life. So you know, if we we tend to live in a world right uh, where the computer is starting to make music so much and we're we're using the computer to make it. But when you see a real human being standing in front of a camera with no bells and whistles, no editing, no reverb, and they're still able to make a, a, a short little piece of music come to life and feel so um, expressive, it's, it's sort of a special thing. But there's definitely been certain pieces that just just by accident, or I don't know how I created it, it happened. The very first piece I wrote was a flute piece. And the flute community around the world has just gone crazy about this flute piece. And I listen to it now, and I've heard so many flutists play the piece, the same piece over and over again, on different sizes of flute, piccolo, the regular yeah. concert flute. On alto, there was a guy who played uh, a contrabass flute in the I Netherlands. It was lot. humongous, you know? Yeah, yeah, I never like knew a, that instrument existed. If you couldn't even fit the thing on the camera, it was so huge. <laughs> yeah. It's like a foghorn, you know? And it, yeah. But there was some endearing quality about it, so, like, uh, tonally. I've had people play, like, certain pieces on different instruments. So, for example, the first performance of the cello piece, I believe, was... Uh, uh, was on actually the first performance of the cello piece was on that contrabass uh, clarinet and the the violin piece has been performed a lot but one of the first performances of the violin piece was on a classical guitar you know so it's just like people are just you know getting excited and trying it neat like uh, there's a person I think the day you posted this piano piece Neil somebody else also in the Netherlands posted the exact same piece the easy piano piece on like a like an old fashioned synth, you know, oh. some kind of a Kurzweilie type of thing, you know, it had a, such a cool sound to it, you know. So it's just an example of how people are, and I, and this is the cool thing. I've really made this clear early on, especially with the um, the stuff we're going to talk about later, the 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 songs, right? I like especially more of the pop songs. I told my friends, you know, my singer songwriter friends, I like listen. I want you to do a cover. I don't care. You can reinvent it, do whatever you want. If for me, this whole project is not just about me writing and getting people to play my music, but also just sharing ideas of what's possible with my music and to get new ideas of how to hear my own music. So it's been um, it's been really cool in that way and very engaging. Right on. Yeah, yeah, and that, that's absolutely the highlight of, of this whole project from from an, uh, an audience member pers perspective too. Is to see, yeah, like you say, the different interpretations of how how people take this because it, it's it's interesting. I mean, it's kind of harking back to the old fashioned days where, you know, before radio, the only thing you had was a piece of sheet music to go off of, and you had no recording to base your performance off of. You had to read the sheet music and interpret it the way you were going to interpret it. Right. But now we have the ability, of course, to share that with everybody. <laughs> so it's interesting to see all the different all the different ways that people take it on. So how, how about we listen to the uh, to the song? So you, you wrote an actual song as in like guitar and vocalist. 
Yeah, so I've written, actually, just to be clear, I've written four songs for this project. Um, there are all the titles. The other thing about the project that I didn't want to do is I wanted the titles of all the pieces to be non-descriptive because it's they're just little ditties and that type of thing. And they're pe different pieces are going to mean different things to different people. So so all of the titles are music for self-isolation, name of instrument or voice. So so mm -hmm. far I've written voice, voice two, voice three and voice four. And tomorrow I'm going to write the fifth and final voice. I'm going to write a, a thing. So voice and voice two are a cappella acapella solos that are more for operatic singing. Voice three is what we're going to talk about, which is like more of a um, uh, acoustic folky type of song. And voice four is is again more poppy, like but a little more musical theater with a piano accompaniment. So so, yeah, I wanted to sort of cover my bases and have something to share with all of my various friends, you know, depending on what their thing is, especially for voice. It's such a specific thing. So, yeah. So that's what we're going to discuss tonight. Voice three. So, OK, so we're going to start with your your demo recording of it. Correct? Right. And uh, OK, so let's just uh, play that. So this is music for self-isolation voice three with guitar by Frank Horvat. If I never slept again Harsher realities would come to an end For soft is the night in which I travel Mysteries Easier to unravel Pale looking glass Hangs on indigo sky Embedded with the olden delights Things forgotten in the break of day the knowing before we started to stray with empty promise of easy tomorrows and the jade to Relieve all your sorrows For those of us who remember the dance The promise of transcendence in a shared glance Okay, so that was uh, Music for Self-Isolation, Voice 3 by Frank Horvat. How did you work with the lyricist on these pieces? What was that process like? Are you sorry? I, I no, I muted myself. Sorry, because in case I wanted to sing along or something, you know. Um, so uh, lyrically, I decided that what I'm going to do here is I'm going to work from set poems. So what we just heard there is a poem by Kathleen Burke. Uh, a good friend of mine. Uh, she lives up in uh, Northern Ontario. She's a poet and an artist, and uh, we've known each other for many years when she lived here in Toronto. And and uh, we've always talked about 
collaborating. And so this has been an exciting thing about this project. The first piece I wrote for this project, I got the text from none other than William Shakespeare. Uh, the set, some guy named Shakespeare. The, yeah. But then the other, the other pieces I've been getting from friends of mine who we've always been talking about working together and me setting some of their poetry. So that's been an exciting process. Very nice. Uh, did, did you play the guitar or...? No, uh, I will. I do not play the guitar. I am a pianist. That is a sample. That sample. is that yeah. is a sample from uh, for all the tech uh, geeks out there or the gearheads. Uh, that is uh, from Complete Ultimate Twelve. It's called Strumming Acoustic. So, oh, it's so, yeah. so it's very clear. I'm happy. Neil made it clear that is a demo. I am not a singer and I'm not a guitar player. But what I do is I, especially for the vocal things, I want to create something that, especially for the more pop stuff, that the uh, my friends can use as a reference. You know, uh, just to get started. So, so I wanted. You could see in that piece, I just kept looping the same chord progression for every verse and uh, didn't want to do anything fancy with it because it's more or less just there to be a, a reference, you know, um, to go along with the vocal idea. Everything really, really simple. Mm -hmm. you, yeah, but the melody, yeah. the melody shifts a lot verse, verse to verse. Like the melody yeah. is not uh, verse to verse, right? That's, that's where the creativity came in, yeah, because I, just, I was just trying to come up with something that was more about showcasing the lyrics. The lyrics are very poignant, and, and on the theme of being hopeful and optimistic, that's, I'm picking text to work with for any of the vocal songs that are are on that theme and that's something we definitely need at this time and so so i think it's important to be able to hear the words anytime you write a song you know when you go to composition school and they teach you to write songs and they're like hey make sure you write it in a way that it's not straining for the singer to be able to share the words and stuff so so that's especially important here so frank yeah. did you, um provide people with with the chords or some kind of musical written music or how, how did you give this stuff out to the world so basically if you go to frank horvat.com there's there's a project page for this called music for self-isolation on that one page it's actually starting to get pretty big right now what we're doing is we're embedded we're embedding all of the performances but then at the bottom of the page there's basically like a piece list and it piece list with all the names of the different instruments in alphabetical order. And you basically, uh, on this chart of all the pieces that I've written so far, um, I have like a, 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 a couple of links where you can click on, which is like the PDF, uh, where you can download the PDF of my sheet music, or in this case, this song, the lead sheet. And the lead sheet has the melody, the words, and the chords above it. And uh, and then it also has like a place where you can click and listen to the MP3. Very cool. Mm, okay, would you like to hear um, one of the cover versions? Is that, is that how you refer to these the the artists that uh, do these performances? Cover versions? Yeah, it's interesting, you know, because we've talked. Um, I'm I'm very lucky to like play to have both. What, each of my feet in both sides of the musical strata, right? Which is the more of the pop music world versus the classical music world. And so the first two songs are definitely meant more for the, the classical artists. So I don't call them, hey, you know, uh, my opera singing friend, you know, do a cover of my song. It's a cappella. They're pretty well sticking to the sheet music, you know, in a sort of a classical tradition. But when I'm talking about voice three and voice four, the other two pieces, which are more meant for, uh, you know, a p um, like um, more of a pop type of sensibility, then, yeah, I'm definitely telling, hey, friends, you know, do do a cover of it, you know? And so this is what I'm excited about. I'm happy I'm approached it because that's what we're about to listen to. You're gonna hear people, two of my friends, take this song and do it really, really differently, so. Okay, so this is, uh, who's the first performer? This is Soundbox Big Dolphin. Yeah, that's my that's that's my the alias uh, and my uh, the stage name of my really good friend Jay Muna, who's an absolutely awesome um, musician here in Toronto, blues, uh, acoustic rock, and that type of thing. But but he got so inspired by the song that I did, and he basically made this into some kind of a 
you know, like synthy, almost synthy rock thing, you know, just doing working with a lot of stuff at home. So it was pretty cool what he came up with. Cool. All right. Let's have a listen. For self isolation voice three by Soundbox Big Dolphin, aka J. Muna. <laughs> Interesting take on it. I mean, on on the one level, he didn't really fuss with the melody or the chord changes or anything like that, but is really in the production and the and the sort of lead guitar uh, take of it and the feel, the groove um, that he that he uh, expressed his his interpretation. Yeah, that's what I would, that's what I found it interesting about that that uh, that version of it is just the ideas about orchestration, you know, and and just taking a lot of these ideas and it's like I almost feel like I would have done that if I would have taken the time to, you know, produce that in the studio and stuff. So I liked how the um the guitar at the end, the uh, repeating phrase there at first, I didn't think it sort of it fit through all the key, uh, all the keys, but it actually kind of pulled the song in an interesting way for the end. It worked really well. Yeah, because he was repeating the same melody over underneath over top of each chord change, right? Absolutely, yeah, and and he was really sticking with that. And you know, it's interesting because I didn't really when I wrote that song, I I sort of thought of it as a very traditional folk song. 
like without like a verse or a verse and a chorus, you know, like where a verse just keeps repeating over and over again with with a, with a um, with a, how should I say it with a, like a vocal melodic variation, you know, certain stanzas are given a little more emphasis and climb the ladder a little bit and others. But basically, because the chordal structure stays the same, I was just thinking of it as being the same verse. But it's interesting in this cover that, you know, just the change in in feel and the instrumentation um, makes it feel like there is a chorus, even though the song doesn't have a chorus at all, you know? And then the guy, uh, John, who did a, an acoustic version, well, he really made a chorus, which is very fascinating. Well, that's really interesting. What he, how, did he actually like write a chorus for it? Yeah, like, and he changed up the chord progression and stuff like that, you know, and uh, he's really, he stays true to Kathleen's words. He really didn't touch that very much, but, but I was really, really fascinated about how, like, for me, for me, it was, for me, like, the guitar, I always pictured the guitar as being a little bit more sort of peppy and groovy and rhythmic, you know, with that, da da Da, 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 you know that type of guitar thing and and john uh john lewitt who we're gonna hear his cover of it you know he's a fantastic guitarist and he added some great riffs and licks and and he really took changed the emphasis of the phrasing of like which syllables in the phrase get the emphasis and on top of that he added a chorus and on top of that he changed some of my chord progressions because he changed added in all these riffs and stuff so cool. you know it's, it's it's sort of interesting let's hear it all right here we go if I never slept again That was so cool the way it's, um, you know, he, he turned it almost into a country western song in some ways. And but it, it actually kind of highlighted some of the, the words in a in a more efficient way, especially the tr uh, trend, uh, transcendence line, which I thought was really cool, really stood out the way he handled it. You know, it was it, a real fascinating approach to taking one piece of song, one piece of music and see how many times it could be reinterpreted by different people. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with you. And uh, that's why I, I really love it, you know, because it's sort of like, I definitely hear sort of structurally, 
what I was thinking phrasing wise there and uh, and some of the chord progressions are there and sort of the emphasis on the certain words and that type of thing and some melodic contour. But otherwise, it's it's like what's really cool about this project is that it's it's like his song, too. You know, it's it's him. It's him speaking. And I guess when we're we're in times like this, we were talking about this earlier before we started the podcast. It's sort of like the cool thing about now is that we're all sort of going through this together, you know, and we're all different people going through this thing together. And that's why I'm, I'm really proud of this project because it's, um, you know, it's sort of like, it's not just about me. And often as musicians, we live in a world where it's just, Hey, look at me, look at me, look what I'm doing, look what I'm doing. And it's really, it's really cool to be working on a project where it's like, okay, I create something. And then it's like, Hey world, you do something with this now and let's see what you're going to do with it. And, um, and it's really touching and it makes you feel like, Oh, you know, you know, we all have something to say, even though we have shared messages and stuff. So, speaking of the whole world, how far afield have uh, your musicians come from the the interpretations that have been done of these pieces of yours? Yeah, so I I know for a fact for the ones that I know have done it um, and that have been sharing their their videos and stuff. I know for a fact we've had videos from uh, Chile from South America. We've had um, two or three from Hong Kong, from Asia, um, quite a bit from Europe, and of course, Canada and the US. So it's, uh, it's been it's been all over the place, you know, and uh, that's the that's the other cool thing about the internet, right? It's, it's yeah. so funny, we're all sort of feeling alone now and and sequestered and locked away and can you imagine if this happened all this happened before there was the internet i think you know can you imagine i think honestly i don't want to i don't want to sensationalize or overblow anything or over dramatize anything but i mean we would have a lot of mental illness would have a lot of people terribly depressed i mean i've been on this show how many times with you guys and it's always a pleasure and it feels like in a certain way we're doing what we normally do when we're on a song talk radio episode. Isn't that cool? And thank you, internet, you know? So Exactly. exactly. I mean, the, you could think to, they always talk about the Spanish flu. That was a hundred years ago. Certainly no internet, no TV, no, you know, it would have been a very different uh, world. It was a lot harder to find videos of cats. So yes, yeah. to go around <laughs> to find cats to watch. It wasn't quite the same, but you know, they got by. Yeah. What I really liked about about uh, John's version of your song, Frank, is how he, he he literally did build a chorus into that by lifting that melody uh, for that one. I mean, you, you you wrote it as a verse, but since he lifted that melody so much, it just it totally made a chorus out of it. And, you know, we, we've been we've been talking, the three of us have been talking about doing a show, a special theme show about songs that uh, don't change their chord progression. Um, throughout the song, but how do you how do you uh, pull apart the chorus? How do you how do you bring a chorus out of a song where the chord progression doesn't change? And of course, melody is the obvious way; it plays a large part of it. But this is a great example of how he's given uh, a song with the same chord progression and ostensibly a, a similar range of melody for the verses that you wrote. But then he just he just took that melody up an octave, and boom, you got yourself a chorus. Yeah, and, and you're bang on. And, and I think John and Jay's covers really demonstrate how to do that. You know, jo- uh, John's, you know, even though it's just him and an acoustic guitar and uh, and he was doing a bit what I did in my original, which is just strategically picking various verses and then just highlighting and sort of climbing the ladder melodically, going into a new range just to heighten the expressiveness. But, you know, the chords are basically the same. And then for Jay, Jay was sort of doing that a little bit too, but also using instrumentation to emphasize that, even though the chord progression wasn't really changing. So, you know, you really, you know, we always talk about in in songwriting about the importance of keep it simple. Um, and that's a huge thing about like, you know, pick what pick what musical elements will stay the same. In this case, it's the chord progression. It's always just the same. So if 
keep that the same, but then think about what other musical elements are you going to change? And that's the sort of the tie in together. And it keeps everything really simple. Like it didn't take me, it literally took me an hour to write that song, you know, mm -hmm. um, and not very much time. And I know John, maybe Jay, it took him a while because of all the production, but I know John, he probably just sat there. He's such an awesome guitar player and singer. He's always writing songs. And I'm sure he, he just wing that off in a couple hours or whatever, you know? So it's just, you know, if you keep things simple, uh, good ideas often come from simple ideas. That's the other thing this project has been great about, because you guys mentioned earlier, you know, oh, well, because I have to write, I've been giving myself the, the thing of writing every day, and then I don't want, you know, my friends to be struggling too much with whatever. It's fascinating how the best ideas are often the ideas where you don't try too hard and you don't overthink it and you just keep everything really simple. And a lot of the songs are, and the pieces are, are really getting good feedback, I think, because of that. And I'm proud of them too when I listen to it, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, when when I did that that first uh, uh, easy intermediate piano piece that you that you wrote um, for myself, like I, I sat down with it at first and thought, oh, this is kind of it's it's interesting. It's a little bit different than what I'm used to with my normal pop sensibility type of stuff. And I, I, I admit I had to practice it for a good couple hours and sort of, you know, figure it out and write down the chord changes on top of the notes <laughs> and things like that, just so I just so I can map out where I was. But the interesting for me thing for me was that I think your demo uh, recording was recorded to a metronome. It was it was on a grid. Yes, yes it was. So, and so I, 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 I figured out what tempo that was and then practiced it to the to the to the click. And then when I got time to uh, practicing it a little bit more, I turned off the click and then just sort of felt my way through it. And and ultimately, I ended up drifting the tempo quite significantly because the quieter parts were slower and the more engineer parts were, were louder. And I and I preferred it that way. And it was just and it and it felt more real to me then. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Yeah. So for for this project, all these demos I'm creating, whether it's the songs, the vocal songs or the instrumental pieces, uh, every everything has a demo. But yeah, I purposely I don't make the demos too. Um, I don't want to say like they're not too artistically flamboyant because they're first and foremost there as a reference. I mean, you guys heard my original piece and you're so nice to give me compliments about whatever the guitar, you know, sample or whatever, or my singing. But I just, I didn't want to do anything too fancy because I think that's a job of a songwriter and a composer that's passing yeah. stuff off to another musician is you can't make things too complicated or not allow the the performer their ab the ability for their themselves to put their stamp on it you know what i mean if you make it too contrived and too polished then there's no room and and neil your own personal experience is a perfect example of what i was doing there you know yeah and and that's certainly true for you know for cover songs in general that especially for popular artists that you know you're trying to cover a popular artist you when you're when this is when you're starting out you try to tend to sing the way that they sing with their expressive nuances and the kind of flourishes and things that they put on it but like you're saying Frank the way you did it is you gave you you provided the artist with pretty much a clinical kind of reference point and and that really allows the artist to sort of express their their own thing and they don't really have have anything to refer to for flamboyance or or no interest yeah. yeah, for me, I'm not using this project to, I mean, I have projects that I work on where I get to play piano and, and showcase, you know, my my piano playing and do concerts and put out albums of me playing piano. And that's my opportunity. But as a pianist, I really enjoy writing piano pieces for other pianists, you know, and I, there's piano pieces that I've written where I've never performed that piece and only those other people have done it. And this is what's been cool about this project. I, I don't, I haven't done my own bit. People have asked me, oh, when are you going to do a video of you playing one of these pieces? And the answer is never. I'm not going to do it because that's not my job here. You know, I, I, I'm enjoying just being like sort of the writing and just sticking with the writing and letting the world put their stamp on these pieces. So maybe when the next pandemic hits, you can reflect back on this and do a couple of uh, your own <laughs> from the previous pandemic. Yeah. Well, let's hope so. Not. 
Frank, so not, you, you had expectations of some sort going in, things that you wanted to do with this. Can you think of any one or two things that have surprised you that you didn't expect that you discovered doing this project? Uh, this is going to sound really weird to say, and this is probably uh, what I'm about to say is deeply rooted in my uh, the issues I've had in my life with self-esteem and depression and that type of thing. But but what is really sort of mildly freaked me out is is the impact the music is making, like the messages I get from people. And, uh, you know, I'm like, you know, I'll get these messages from people about how the music made them feel and and, you know, and it's just some, you know, it's not a formal album or a formal presentation concert. It's just like some random person was, you know, just passing on through in their news feed on Facebook. And they, you know, their friend posted this video and all of a sudden, you know, they're like, what the heck is this? This is this is the most beautiful thing. It just the music at that time and place touched their soul of what was going on and then they they get back to me and tell me about you know uh, what kind of gift this was and i'm like well this is just some little you know social media you know spoof thing you know well, what 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 the heck is this? And it, it just reminds me like these little pieces that I'm composing, I'm making them simple and it's just something to, as a means to engage and connect with my musical friends and that type of thing. And what ends up happening now is that because my friends are spreading the music and their, their followers are listening, they're really getting impacted and they'll tell very deeply personal stories about loss they've had in their life and and the, how they're struggling right now either financially or with a loved one that they have to be self-isolating with and uh you know it's 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 really it i guess what i'm trying to say is it never gets tiring to hear about the power of music you know we 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 are we all of us you know all of us, we do music every day. It's our love and passion. So nobody has to sell us on that concept of the impact of music on our life because we just do it every day. But once in a while, when you hear from other people that tell you deeply, profoundly how music impacts you, it realizes we do have a special gift as songwriters, as composers, as performers. And it's basically reminded me that a never, ever should ever take that for granted. Absolutely. Excellent. Well, thank cool. you for this project, uh, Frank. It, it, I, I've listened to a number of the pieces, and I, I find them uh, very, some of them are very beautiful, very haunting, and they do express uh, um, reflection and isolation and, and that kind of, you know, reverie. So, so nice is... So kudos. Thank kudos. you, Mr. Proudfoot. Thank you. <laughs> and one thing I've noticed is so often when we put as musicians, we do music and we put it out there and nothing happens. You never hear anything back from it. You, you know, like your odd friend plays it, but you know, there's like silence being returned and it's so nice to actually have, you know, the world take up this and kind of add energy to it. It's a very hard thing to do these days, even though we are connected, it's, it's hard to get people to actually take action. And this has done an amazing job. Yeah, you know, I, I, that's why it's like, it feels like one of those, I've had maybe just like a handful of projects in my life where it's just like, it seems like it just has a life of its own and it, it goes on its own. And definitely, this has definitely been one of them. And it's been such a, uh, I'm so grateful to have had this opportunity because honestly, I don't know about you guys, but I don't feel like I've been... I'm nowhere close to struggling right now. You know, I have so much to be grateful for. I have a, I have a home. I have a loved ones to, to spend my time with. I have food. I'm, I have my health. You know, a lot of people are really sick right now. And, and most, most importantly, I have something that I'm really passionate about. So I think, I think it's, this project has really 
just saved me. And I'm noticing that a lot too. I don't know about you guys, but just being on social media, how much more people are sharing their music, you know? It's like sucks that we can't go to a live club and or be together and have that tangible thing of being in the same room as somebody's creating music. But the outcome of it has just been the absolutely amazing amount of music making and people doing it together. That's not an element of my project at all. I, I created these solo pieces thinking that people are lonely and all by themselves. But since I started this three or four weeks ago, more and more people are doing like the split screens and all of this stuff and collaborating. It's like, isn't this exciting? It's like we're all helping each other get through this stuff and art is the best thing for it, you know, so. Yeah, very true. Yeah, very true. I mean, I've been I've been constantly on social media, just a lot of my Friday nights, Saturday nights now are going to just watching live streams of artists that I follow and artists that I dig and they're doing, you know, live streaming things and they're using looping pedals and they're putting on full performances just by themselves. Or, I mean, in fact, uh, Bare Naked Ladies have been doing the split screen thing, I think once a week, they've been uh, publishing a song. That one of, from one of their repertoires. It's just nice to see, you know, people still getting together. So um, even so, the big question is because we are because as a music community, on one hand, the music community is struggling right now. A lot of musicians are struggling for income and that type of thing. Especially my friends who are, you know, gigging musicians, and that's their primary thing of income. But now we're all we're also seeing all this immense amount of creativity. And, you know, it's it's exciting and scary all at the same time. Like when this is all said and done and we're going to stop self-isolating, how is this whole experience going to change how we make music uh, and how we interact with each other in making music? You know, it's it's like exciting and scary about the prospects of like how our individual creative outputs are all going to go after this it's it's staggering i can't help but think about that and i don't know the answer i'm just asking yeah. questions you it's, know it's a great big gray area no one really knows what's going to happen next in terms of i mean you know like the I, 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 my biggest fear is that a lot of the venues that we love to go to and see live shows are not going to be able to carry forward and I don't know what's going to happen with regard to that. Well, a lot of them in big cities. I know where we live in the city of Toronto, a lot, even before all this happened, a lot were, were closing yeah. because of like the, the price of real estate and that kind of thing. And a lot of major cities around the world are, are going through the same problem, you know. So is this going to push a lot of places, live venues over the edge where they just can't come back after this? So, you know, it's and, and then what's going to come out of it to replace that you know mm -hmm. there's always going to be music there will yeah. always be music until as long as there's human beings on this planet there will always be music it's just a question of how we are going to go about making it and sharing it and i can't help but think that this is cataclysmic and gargantuan enough that it's going to seriously change about how we how we do things you know so how i don't know yeah. yeah, not until we get through to the other side will we have any idea. But there's going to be permanent changes in how we relate together in society, for sure. For sure. I'm not sure that, uh, it's quite a graceful segue, but talking about getting together and making music, Neil, did you want to talk about the meetup? Well, uh, we're still uh, in negotiations, but we're hoping to do um, an online meetup. Um, but, uh, I think, uh, you know, we, we, we have to, we still have to take some time and sort of, uh, maybe do a beta test <laughs> with, um, with a few of our members and then we can take it, you know, live to the whole group, uh, sort of thing. But, uh, it, you know, but the, the, the fact that this is now our second podcast doing this and, you know, given that I have literally, this is like the third time I've used Skype in my life. Um, <laughs> it's, you know, it's, it's kind of a new thing for me, uh, doing the, the whole, you know, webcam meeting thing. So, you know, it's uh, it's a work in progress, but uh, it's certainly it's, it's certainly something we're looking at. And uh, and who knows? I mean, if, if it works out well, again, you know, moving forward after after we get back to, you know, so-called normal. You know, it may be uh, something that we continue to do and do some uh, do some more online activities uh, through the meetup. Like it's it's certainly something that's a, that the potential's there and, uh, yeah. and it 
<laughs> well, well, like Frank's project, it enables it us enables to reach out to people, people around the world in a way world. that we yeah. can't do when we do a, a live in Toronto show. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, but by, by virtue of being online, you can literally have... I mean, we get a lot of diversity at the meetup, all kinds of different songwriters and, and different uh, ability levels and, and everything. And I could only imagine <laughs> taking that worldwide and the kind of um, amazing participation we would get from that. Like, there's a lot of potential there. All right. Well, that's, uh, well, um, yeah, thanks, Frank. This was, it's an amazing um, thing that you put out into the world. And I think it's been a, it's it's going to be interesting to see how many more people pick it up and and do their uh, impressions of it. Yeah, Have you more pieces depending on rating, Frank? So I, I I will share this publicly for the first time. I actually decided Pretty this. I I'm going to share it. This is an exclusive to Song Talk Radio. I I have decided uh, that this will have to end because it is it is sort of an intense thing in life, and I actually do have to get on to other projects. So um, and continue projects that I've already started. So I I am going to uh, I want to get to thirty pieces. Basically, I don't know why I picked the number thirty. I just finished the twentieth today, okay. and uh, and I also I when I first started four weeks ago, uh, I think I, I released and wrote the first piece on Wednesday, March twenty fifth, and then for the next three weeks or so, I wrote a piece every day and released it. And I realized, oh, that had to stop because I was <laughs> mildly getting burned out, like in between, you know, interacting and emailing and messaging people and replying to emails and watching videos. I like literally had no time, never mind like the other stuff I'm doing in life. So I basically, I've been toning it down. I'm just like trying to do about four or five pieces. And if I keep doing that, then I'll be done um, very beginning of May, May 1st, May 2nd, and that'll be 30th. And then I'll have a nice collection and uh, a nice representation of most of the most common instruments. And, uh, and it's something then I'll look at as sort of a nice, um, keepsake and uh, almost like a musical memento of this period in our history and this will be sort of my my time capsule of this so so you, you know it's it, it, it so may get occurred. to ukulele huh yeah. i don't know you guys are really pushing me for the ukulele i know ukulele is popular but i'll tell you why i don't want to write for the ukulele because i'm afraid of the ukulele <laughs> i i don't know i never i don't play the ukulele so i'm really freaked out about it you don't yeah. play the guitar. No, I pull back. It's true. <laughs> That's maybe a and tiny whistle struggling. or a mandolin. And, and you know, and for for non guitar players or so, I understand ukulele is like so much easier to learn. So you could always pick up, you know, a ukulele and and try it out. I'll have to order one on Amazon or something. Yeah. I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm sure. If you did pick up a ukulele, Frank, you would come up with a pretty unique way to use it. <laughs> I'm almost afraid. Yeah. <laughs> Front spheres. And I, I, again, I would certainly encourage our listeners to check out uh, Frank Horvat's website, frankhorvat.com, and, and check out this this project because it is it is fascinating and interesting. And, and like you say, it's, it's totally taken on a life of its own. It's amazing. Really, really cool. Yeah. Thanks Thank so you. much. Yeah, yeah, it, Thank you. Just a shout out, shout out to all of the artists that have, that have contributed to this project from all around the world. And just a quick uh, repeat of some of the people we heard tonight. So there was uh, Jay Muna um, and uh, John Lewitt and uh, the writer of the text, the poet, uh, Kathleen Burke. So, so kudos to them as well. Absolutely. Okay, so I think that's a, that's a wrap for us, you guys? It is. I've said all, all right. I can say. Okay. <laughs> okay, that is all the time we have tonight on the show. This has been Song Talk Radio. Special thanks to our guest Frank Horvat, and of course, uh, what's your what's your favorite social media channel, Frank? What can our listeners follow you? Uh, I'm pretty good. I'm very good with Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. I'm I, I have to get going on Instagram. So I'm I don't know about you guys, but I'm having a hard time getting the Instagram going just for myself to use it so so i'm gonna work hard at instagram but yeah the good old-fashioned facebook is awesome so All right and of course you can send us your impressions on twitter facebook or instagram at song talk radio or send us an email at feedback at songtalk.ca and be sure to check out our youtube channel for live performance videos and full episodes 
And please stop by the site at songtalk.ca and subscribe today to the Song Talk Radio Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher.com, Spotify, Podcast Addict, TuneIn.com, many others. And don't forget to sign up for our free newsletter at songtalk.ca. You can also find links to all the products, books, and web services we mentioned on the show on our resources page on the website. And uh, stay tuned uh, for the meetup. Uh, we will be sending out some uh, notes and messages once we figure out what the heck we're doing. And, uh, of course, uh, it's it's always free to join on meetup.com and free to attend the, the meetup. Uh, and you can stop by songtalk.ca for the link. A uh, big thank you uh, to our very own Venice of Reland for her help behind the scenes at Song Talk Radio. And uh, most of all, we'd like to thank you, our devoted listeners and viewers. Uh, you can follow me at meetup.com. You can follow Phil at the Phil Emery on Twitter. On Twitter. <laughs> Mike? And me on Instagram, Proudfoot420. And of course, Frank on, on Facebook, you're Frank Horvat or Frank Horvat Music? Uh, I'm, yeah, I'm all those things, I think. Yeah. Frank, <laughs> FrankHorvat.com is the best yeah. place to that for. Absolutely. And of course, stop by the good old website, songtalk.ca, to browse past shows and find out how you can be a guest. Everyone stay safe and keep on writing. Good night, everyone. Good night.